Welcome to season one of Top Crop. We found out that the ground is alive. Trying to get done a little quicker and trying to simplify things a little bit. You know, there's only so much money to go around. I look for big wins. Yeah, we got a little bit of hail damage, you know, when you get in here, but not a whole lot. Got some gray coming in. Right to your right, the leaf to your right, right above you, left, right there. Yeah. A little gray leaf spot. A little gray leaf spot coming in. Just a little. Corey, how bad was the tar spot here two years ago? Not bad enough to where I don't want to jinx myself. Yeah. But um, we've had it the last two years. Yeah. So tar spot is something that it has not demolished us, but we've seen it come in late really late. So it's definitely something we're watching. Um, I think as of today, there's seven confirmed counties in Ohio yeah. that already have confirmed tar spot. That's always a concern of ours. Yeah, so, something to think about. Last year, um, we had a fairly dry spell across the Midwest and tar spot came in really late. You know, back in 2021, we had two uh, tar spot that hit us pretty good. And the guys that, where I live in Northern Indiana, if you didn't spray fungicide at least once in a lot of areas in like that North Central Indiana, it was a 60 bushel yield hit. What I'm fearful of is the guys last year didn't see it coming to really late. It didn't really impact the yield that much. They're thinking maybe this year they can get away without a fungicide application. And I'm telling you, don't be fooled by tar spot. Tar spot can come on strong with weather, even if it comes with late, so. Um, the big deal about tar spot is there's no true way to stop it. The best thing that we can do is manage through it. And Corey, a lot of the things that you do early on this plant can have impact how this plant works and, and functions through a tar spot period, you know, late in season. So, you know, it's like vitamins for a human. You know, if we're healthy and, and we end up getting sick with a cold or COVID, you know, we can generally withstand those storms a little bit better, right, if we're healthy. Um, in a situation with, with corns the same way. We got a healthy corn plant, it can withstand that uh, infection better. Well, one thing that we always try to do is keep, you know, the healthiest plant slash factory that we can always have through, throughout the year. Because that's one of our concerns is just for any disease pressure, it's a lot easier yeah. to fight off when you have a healthy plant compared to a sick plant. Um, we want to take as much nutritional problems out that we can because of Mother Nature bringing in different disease pressure. Keep that plant pumping, keep that factory metabolizing and taking photosynthesis and turn it into energy. So I noticed you got a little bit of, of gray leaf spot that started in here, just a, a few lesions that I've seen. Um, nothing major as of yet, so this field uh, was recently done with the fungicide, so I feel pretty confident that you've uh, done a good job managing that, so kudos to you on that piece of it. One thing with this field that I'm really excited for is uh, John, I think you brought me a new product this year. Yes, so Architect is our uh, brand new EPA registered early season uh, PGR with the nutritional package. It's the first ever registered PGR with the nutritional package through the EPA. So we've got some trials of that out this year. Um, the function of Architect is really to relieve that early season stress and then the micronutrients are in there to help support photosynthesis. So those secondary micros are essential to photosynthesis. We just want to build a, a bigger leaf structure, bigger leaf index, bigger solar panel to capture energy early and then make that early season push through to you uh, come back out for your second pass with your fungicide application. Well, and that's exactly what I was just looking at here. This year, my biggest concern is how much solar energy we've had because of our neighbors to the north the wildfires, have been smoking yeah. us out. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, right. And don't think for a minute that's not a stress on this crop. It is, right. it yeah. is, and we have not had the solar units that mm -hmm. we've typically had the past three years. Right. We're actually in the past three years, we're 365 GDUs behind schedule. Yeah. Really? So that is one of our concerns here. You know, if we don't have solar, we don't have GDUs, we don't have photosynthesis, we don't have energy into that plant. Right. So that's where, when you guys approach about Architect and being able to add that on at that V5 time frame, I was really excited for it. Definitely looks like it's doing its job here. I'm excited to take it to yield. 
and see if we can't get it on every acre next year. Most of the industry calls it the, the vegetative stage. Um, at AgX, we, we tend to call it the architecture phase because we're building a plant structure. You know, we want to build a bigger, fatter, wider leaf and a longer leaf because leaves are what? They're solar panels, right? So if we can build a bigger solar panel to caps or sunlight, that's great. But that's only the first step of it. The second step is you got to have the micronutrients within that plant to accept sunlight and physically do something with it. And it takes, takes micronutrients like copper, iron, manganese, zinc, molybdenum, boron, um, for example, to be able to take that sunlight and physically turn it into acetate inside that plant, the plant's natural energy molecule. Um, and that's what Architect does, you know, laced with, with uh, a PGR to stimulate that root and shoot growth, right? Drive those roots down, create that big plant biomass, physically accept that sunlight and do something with it. That's what you did early, and that set the stage for what we see today. And that's why this at recent application you made of Onward Max, along with your fungicide, is a big deal. It's about managing this plant, right? These plants, this crop, all the way through. We've really been fine-tuning our Inferro program over the past couple of years and running some products that are really making a difference with this early season root growth. So we love our Pivot Bio, using that product number one, and then we're adding some things to not only feed that Pivot Bio, but feed the corn plant as well. So some sugar sources, a carbon source, just trying to get these little plants off to the best start we can get them. So this is one of our open pollinated corn fields and this variety is Jimmy Red. It's a really old southern variety uh, that was bred I believe out of the state of South Carolina and having open pollinated corn definitely throws a little bit of extra mix into the operation. Weed control, you know, we don't have Roundup, we don't have Liberty, um, but a lot of people think if you're growing non-GMO or open pollinated corn that you don't have any chemistry at all. We can still use atrazine, dual. Um, this farm here was actually sprayed with Armazon Pro. That's probably when one of our best herbicides in our open pollinated is uh, getting that, that Armazon Pro out there early, keeping the ground covered. Um, I think 2023 in the south is gonna be known as the year of the morning glories. Uh, you can see, you know, we've got a little bit of morning glory outbreak in, in underneath the canopy. We're hoping as the corn continues to get taller, we'll start seeing some of that shaded out. It's one of those things that we battle every year here in North Carolina, but um, planted this population at about 24,000, which is really low. But for open pollinated corn, it's got a really good flex variety to it. So we'll get a really big girthy year, a big kernel, which is what we're looking for. Um, because this, this corn is actually intended to go to food grade. So we'll grind it up into grits and cornmeal, or we'll actually make bourbon or whiskey out of it. Uh, it's some of the better, better bourbon and whiskey I've ever had. And, um, so that's kind of the, the end use is, is looking at the food grade system. And so we can, we can get a premium, premium price for our corn and uh, turn it into a product for people to have fun with. Yeah, like if we were in a production system, so like two years ago, we had a hybrid corn here. Uh, we planted this field roughly about 29,000 to 30,000 ears to the acre. Um, about four years ago, maybe it's two to four years ago, we, we uh, we actually experimented the first time on 60 inch row corn at this field and, and put out some information on it where we, we did a 30 inch row and then a 60 inch skip, a 30 inch row and a 60 inch skip. We actually broadcasted a summer cover crop mix into this field in the 1st of August. By the time it was you know growing up in, in full maturity and harvested the corn, we had about 8,500 pounds of biomass of cover crop there that we could then graze with animals. So this farm here, we picked it up about six or seven years ago uh, it was pretty tough ground, uh, low on organic matter. Fertility really wasn't that great. It had been hayed for a long time and really over hayed with no fertility put on it. So it took us about three or four years of cover crops and our crop rotation uh, to really get this ground kind of built back up where it would, it would sustain a good crop. Yeah. Yeah, they're different day lengths. Uh, this variety here is about 115 days, um, which is, pretty mid-range season for us here. Um, we did get it planted a little bit late. Uh, we were really wet and, and you know colder during April. That put us behind and then for whatever reason when the water shut off we had about a three week period there in May. Everything kind of got hard and tough and um, we really wanted to play around on this field so 
on these open pollinated corn varieties, we're really selecting for our seed stock genetic for next year. And so on the left-hand side of the field, uh, we planted the crop at two inches deep. Um, I was kind of scared to do the whole field. What I wanted to do, I was afraid of losing the whole entire crop. But uh, we've got a couple flags um, that we've set up down the rows, running our AB lines. And on the right-hand side of this field, we planted this corn four inches deep. Um, that's probably some of the deepest corn we've ever planted, but really we were selectively trying to look for the genetics with the best emergence. Um, and not being a seed company and not having a way to do that any other way than just plant that corn as deep as we could get it, which we were averaging three and a qu three quarter inches to four inches deep. And we did lose some stand count because of that, but it just goes to show that our best genetics are, are what's gonna be out in this field. And we'll come out here probably within a week or so a black layer and we'll hand pick our cobs uh, for our seed stock going into next year and we'll shuck those and, and hang them and dry them and then uh, and then we'll be able to have a better seed stock and better genetics and that's really a lot of people talk about these open pollinated corn varieties don't yield very well um, and some of them don't but you can plant them in your environment and do a program where you say you plant it deeper for better emergence and then we look at stalk strength and we look at ear uh, height placement and then we select those genetics for the following year's crop and and every year that we've done that we've continued to see higher and higher yields out of these old open pollinated varieties call open pollinated corn varieties want more nitrogen up front and less nitrogen on the back end don't know why um, that's just one of the things we've learned if you put too much nitrogen on this corn later in the season um, you'll really see a lot of lodging um, and that's one of the things we've also learned is when this corn is running about 20 to 25 percent you better get it out of the field uh, when you start seeing the tops get blown out of it you've probably got about a three to five day window before you're starting to see the bottoms fall out of it too and then you've got a mess but it's it's fun to grow something a little bit different and it's fun to grow something that we can actually see converted into a food uh, where we're actually feeding people either food or, or giving them a good time with some bourbon. We've really been fine-tuning our infro program over the past couple of years and running some products that are really making a difference with this early season root growth. So we love our Pivot Bio using that product number one and then we're adding some things to not only feed that Pivot Bio but feed the corn plant as well. So some sugar sources, a carbon source, just trying to get these little plants off to the best start we can get them. The fungicide we're using is Veltima. because our third year with it. It's been working great. Uh, there has been some tar spot already spotted in Northern Ohio. Normally we've already flown all of this corn, but we was able to wait until July 26 today. It's already past blister stage, starting to fill out already. We've been able to keep disease pressure away and Veltima should, that should protect us all the way through the rest of the season. Welcome to Top Crop. We're here at Springfield Airport. We've been uh, spraying some crops all day long and to, right now I'd like to introduce you to uh, Gunther from Ag Explore. Ag Explore is a company that deals specifically in fertilizer management and, and um, technology. So we know that when all of us as ag professionals and farmers go to meetings, we talk about the four R's in agriculture, the right rate, the right product, the right time, the right place. We believe at Ag Explorer that there's a fifth R and it's that right technology. It's that technology to take nutrition that's in the soil and make it efficient and available to the crop or once it's inside that plant, technologies that drive that nutrition efficiency inside of plants and get it to where it needs to go so we can get more out of what we get inside of it and, and ultimately raise better yield. We tried the Onward Max last year. We had great response. Um, good enough that I don't like talking about bushel response because you know, yeah. When, when, you, when you have a really good hit like that, you want to be careful. So this year we've got it on a lot of acres, corn and beans this year. And uh, me being an independent company, I love products like this coming, coming from Ag Explorer. So that way I can offer it to, 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 to the different farmers across America. Because you guys have such an awesome lineup of different products at different timing. And that's what I love. There's no uh, silver bullet per se. Right. You have you know, this product strictly 
is for corn at tassel, correct? It, it, it's That's corn, where it's soybeans, best. Yes. That late season reproductive time frame. You know, PGRs. PGRs are mostly intended as an industry to go early season. All about roots and shoots, right? Mm -hmm. IBA and kinetin, for example. This one is all about late season plant health, right? It's about dropping stress inside that plant because we know Mother Nature stresses the plant out, and it's all about taking that stress down, increasing photosynthesis, and supporting photosynthesis, and supporting that drive of nutrient movement source to sink, pulling out that leaf tissue and putting it in that grain and yield and test weight you know corn it's a big deal well, so. you know we've seen 30 to 45 bushel swings off test weight alone right but so you know the reason why the right product's so important let's talk about that for for a minute you know let's say we choose the wrong pgr yeah what's some of the consequences of choosing the wrong pgr i'll give you an example so so a lot of us use some geobacid early in season Gib gibberellic acid is really good at, at taking and telling a plant to spend its energy on emergence and getting that plant up and established if you use jib acid late in season you'll create a beer bottling effect on your ears of corn Corey, I never met a farmer that lacks beer bottle looking corn, so that's no. a problem. So, you know, these are hormones. They tell a plant what to do, just like our human bodies, right? So this one tells it relieve stress, increase photosynthesis, and increase nutrient mobilization. But I think that's really important, you know, for the farmers to understand that this is designed different. So if you've tried a PGR before, a company sold you one to try to tell you to put it in with an airplane at fungicide time, right. and you've seen that effect happen, this, you will not have that happen at all, correct? Correct, correct. This one, guys, if you used it early season, it won't hurt you, but it won't do much for you. Using it late season is where it's designed. You know, when we, when we designed this product several years ago, um, we designed it for that late season, you know, re reducing that stress. We know that Mother Nature, we can do things right all season long, and Mother Nature, at the end of the season, she gets hot, she gets dry, she puts stresses on that crop, and all of a sudden, you start losing yield potential. And uh, that's what we're doing is we're preserving that yield potential and allowing that factory to keep humming and keep producing. So what's the use rate of, of the Onward Max? Yeah, so Onward Max is a concentrated formulation. It is a 6.4 ounce to the acre use rate. So that it's a super low use rate. One jug does a lot of acres. You know, a gallon will do um, 20 acres. So what about mixability, compatibility? You know, here we are, it's fungicide time, insecticide time foliar time yeah yeah How, you know, what's the ease of mixing this right so so product like this has got to be designed to go in those those really low volume site type solutions like for your airplane that's running today it's got to be in that two gallon range right so this product looks like looks and acts like water it is crystal clear um, it's very easy to mix with it goes with a, a lot of your fungicide insecticide nutritional products for those of you that are running some late season potassium um, it's a good tank mix partner to put in right directly with it. What other products would you recommend to run with this? Because I know uh, we, we do have a product that we mix with this on, on the airplane now. And uh, what would be your pick? Let's just see here. You know, guys, one of the things that works really well in late season in nutrition, uh, a product that we're, we're generally missing in, in most of our farms and fields, is boron. Right, so we have a product called XR5 Boron that is a really good product to pair up with it. We also pair in um, another carbon source called Octane. So Octane is a, it's a sugar plus additional carbon technologies. It's a multiple source of carbon um, product that allows that plant to aid and assist in that source to sink movement, driving that nutrition into that kernel. So on a, on a grain and then into a, or on a corn and then into the pod on soybeans. So Boron and Octane are two really good products products to, to take mix with this. Well, Gunny, I want to appreciate you guys coming. I've loved the product, all the products that I've used from you guys, from nitrogen stabilizers all the way up to late season PPGR, we've had great success with. I want to thank you for coming up here today and joining us and seeing the procedure at the airport. Thank Corey, you. Appreciate it, buddy. Farmers deserve a nitrogen that works as hard as they do. One that stays with the crop until the job is done. It's time to turn to a better nitrogen with Pivot Bio. Next probably will be a V10 Valtima application. It's so much more than fungicide. It goes above and beyond disease control. Really like the BASF fungicides. It's a stress mitigator, it's plant health. We have applied a toad on this farm, you know. Done a great job for me. 
definitely money made. Yeah, definitely absolutely. Money. See how green this still is? That's right. It's never too early to be talking about a program anymore. Top crop question of the day. If you plant a 110 day variety beside of a 120 day variety, the only difference in that corn plant is that a 110 day variety will get to tassel faster than 120 day. But a lot of people don't know that when that tassel comes out, corn will not grow any taller. It won't put on any more vegetation growth. But the big thing is, is it doesn't matter what the variety is, it takes the same exact number of days from tassel to black layer, the same GDUs. The only difference in our corn day varieties that's different is how fast that it gets to that VT. And a lot, a lot of people growing corn don't even know that. If you look down here, we've got just a little bit of corn residue from two years ago. We've got a little bit of bean residue. I mean, it's a hollow stem. And we've got cover crop residue that's still covering the ground. This is some of our rye. And I mean, it's, I don't know if you can see in that stem or not. Oh yeah. But that stem's hollow. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the biology has broken down a lot of the cover crop of the video that Les shot out here when we were planting. But cover crops still don't make up for this much like a rainfall. Our rainfall pattern has pretty much been, if you're getting water, you've been, you've been maintaining rain showers. If it's an area that's been dry, it just, we haven't been getting showers coming over it. And this is just one of those areas that you'll see rain clouds come out of the mountains and they pretty much split around Morganton and they've stayed a little bit north of here following the river and a little bit south of here following the lower rivers. And I'm hoping that kind of changes now that we're getting closer to reproduction, but we'll see. This might be one of them 100 and 120, 150 bushel fields this year. We've definitely got some leaf curl. I mean, where they're starting to cup up a little bit, but they're not to the point where they're making what I call corn cigars, where they completely wrap around each other. I mean, you get to that point, you're, you're cutting off a lot of yield every day. Right now, we've, we've cut off some top end yield, but if we can start getting some weather, it's definitely still got some potential behind it. There's some plants that if it would have had good moisture so far, we could have had some pretty good stalks on it. What you reading over here? <laughs> a lot worse than a lo over there. A lot worse than over there. Our goal come May when it had turned dry and we looked at planting this was 170 bushels with the weather we had at the time. And that's kind of what we planted for. I didn't even get hardly an inch right there. The way a pentrometer works is you want it to be 75% full pool on moisture or better. That's the, the best time to take these. But essentially at 150 PSI, you'll slow vertical growth of that root by about 50%. At 300 PSI, the root has a hard time breaking through that hard pan at 300. And essentially those roots turn horizontal and they'll stay horizontal unless they find something within their growth rate that goes below the 300 again where they can start going deeper. Um, and so that's why we look at the penetrometer is, is we're seeing, do we have a hard pan? What's it, you know, what is our root growth going to look like? And, you know, cover crops can help alleviate a lot of the soil compaction, but sometimes they can't do it all. So you may have to run a ripper through here, um, run some kind of a strip till rig to kind of break that root zone up where those, that next crop can, can get in and get those, those roots set pretty deep.